तत्सवितुर्भर रूप ज्योति पर धीमह यन्न सत्य दीपे तत्सवितुर्भर रूप ज्योति पर धीमह यन्न सत्य दीपे तत्सवितुर्भर रूप ज्योति पर धीमह यन्न सत्य दीपे so we will pick up last time i think we were on page just let me pull up the page yeah so we stopped at page number 81 uh, and we had also uh, gone through an article an essay by nolini kan gupta which was loan to loan and where he was sharing that how this is an a loan journey and to meet the loan the the one who only is and there is nothing but he and we went through that passage that essay and today uh, we are going to just maybe first read these lines starting from a little maybe beginning of in a divine retreat so page number 80 the last few lines just to have an overlap and then we will take up the few new lines and uh, today also there is another sharing that i have on the way which we can take up rather than rushing through the lines so we'll just uh, take in between a few passages to understand these more deeply so requesting anyone who feels ready uh, one by one we can read these uh, four five lines which are colored differently starting from in a divine retreat from mortal thought may i can <clears throat> in a divine retreat from mortal thought in a prodigious gesture of soul sight is being towered into pathless heights naked of its vesture of money shall i continue yeah i think usually we like pass it back yeah i don't know if sorry i i i don't hear you quite well you don't hear me now i do okay, okay. so i continue with it you can take up and then somebody else can. okay monica your voice is breaking yeah yeah how is it now any better yeah now it okay. is better okay yeah. okay great so uh, i was saying yuan you can read the ones in yellow and then somebody else can go ahead yeah as thus it rose to meet him bare and pure a strong descendant leap down a might a flame a beauty half visible with deathless eyes a violent ecstasy 
a sweetness dire, enveloped him with its stupendous limbs and penetrated nerve and heart and brain that thrilled and fainted with the epiphany. His nature shuddered in the unknown's grasp. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else who would like to go ahead? The lines in blue. Yeah, Monica, I'll go. Yeah. In a moment shorter than death, longer than time, by a power more rush, ruthless than love, happier than heaven, taken sovereignly into eternal arms, hailed and coerced by a stark absolute bliss in a whirlwind circuit of delight and force, hurried into unimaginable depths, unborn, upborn into immeasurable heights, it was torn out from its mortality and underwent a new and boneless change. Yeah, thank you. So these last ones, anyone who feels ready, Rinku or Dr. Anjali? An omniscient knowing without sight or thought and in this indecipherable omnipotence, a mystic form that would contain the worlds, yet make one human breast its passionate shrine, drew him out of his seeking loneliness into the magnitudes of God's embrace. Yeah, thank you so much. So as you know, I was just reminded how Mother and Shri themselves, they have said that how these lines, whether we understand them or not, have their own mantric power. And somebody was sharing with me a few days ago that uh, their parents were uh, devotees of Mother and Shurabindo. And the father specifically, every day he would recite Savitri's lines and not only recite himself loudly, but also he would ask his children to learn them by heart. So children not knowing any meaning, not knowing what's happening, just they just have to learn them by heart like you can say rote learning and she was actually sharing that lady that we really learned them by heart and then he would hear them out you know hear the children out and now in this age of around 50 60 she's realizing that uh, when she's going through issues and challenges in life all those lines as if they because they have been like embedded in their subconscious you know memory they've gone down there they keep on coming up, resurfacing, and they reveal their meanings every now and then. You know, like a support on this path, tumultuous path of life. So I was really, really amazed by uh, how we usually think that rote learning and just learning by, uh, you know, mechanical pattern, it doesn't do any good. But uh, I really wondered at her uh, kind of description that what seeds he sowed then as when they were children, now they are reaping their sprouts. You know? That was really, really very beautiful to uh, see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Monica, I just wanted to share. Uh -huh. See, there is a family in Chennai. You know, they used to live in Singapore. Uh, so uh, that per, uh, person and his wife, both of them will recite Savitri by heart. So he must be about, you know, 70 years now. So we asked him, how did you, you know, learn it? Then he said, one line a day. Each day, one line I'll memorize. And we both, my husband, wife and me will, you know, tell it so many times so that it will get registered in our mind. So he can, because through him, we got, we got inspired. Meera and me, we started reading this uh, um, adoration of the Divine Mother. So we started, you know, even now by her grace, we can uh, say it by heart without having book or anything. So it was uh, beautiful to listen to that couple. You know, the way they recite Savitri, we can, uh, re we can really feel that lines. Though we'll not understand any of the meanings, but you know, something in us will wake up 
it was beautiful. beautiful. See, there are people, no? Mm. So it's a lifetime sadhana, right? We have to one line a day. Mm. He used to say, "It's very easy, ma. Why don't you? Why don't you try? Just mm. one line a day." Mm. Mm. Wonderful. So many lines. We don't know how mm. long it will take, but try. Mm. It wow. was really beautiful. Yeah, 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 beautiful. Really, very beautiful. And I think I, I was also able to see that. Uh, Again, that we have judgments about everything, opinions about everything. And again, for rote learning, we have our own judgments that rote learning doesn't do any good. You know, you must understand and then uh, do the things. But I think everything, as mother says, that everything has its proper place. So rote learning also has its proper place. And uh, now at this stage of her life, she was sharing that instead of going into more darkness and depression, the mind automatically is you know, gone, goes back to these lines which keep on resurfacing. Beautiful. So, yeah, this is really very powerful. So, yeah, I think more. it's a great teaching, you know, for all mm. of us. Mm. Every mm. day, every day we can teach our uh, kids at home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you guys were reading, you know, then I realized that this reading itself is really uh, so enough yeah so here uh, we were reading you know how ashupati's experiences shurabindo's own experiences and how this dissolution of the imprisonment of ego consciousness you know how we are usually just imprisoned in that consciousness and now he's just become wide and expansive and uh, uprooted from this grip of mortality and death and that day, I think we were, yeah, this uh, talk by uh, Ajahn Amaru, uh, we were read, uh, listening to in the meditation uh, session. And there he was sharing that the more we are conscious of our patterns, of things happening in our being, the more we are alive and free also, relatively free. But the more unconsciously we live, as a slave to habits, patterns, limitations of the past, you know, we don't even know why we react in what way that we react. Uh, it's as good as a dead life. So that's why in mothers also, you know, we come again and again to the fact that mother says become conscious. You, know, you must know why you think like that, why you talk like that, why you feel like that. So each ripple of our being must be uh, in our front you know, that I'm able to see it. And this again, there are many, many beautiful, really powerful lines in between. All lines are powerful, but some really for me come like straight on my face, like in a divine retreat from mortal thought. Now remaining in the thought domain, we cannot imagine this expansion. So that's the sadhana. We have to constantly disengage from the surface ripple of thoughts. We have to become less and less sure of our thoughts and feelings. In a divine retreat from mortal thought, in a prodigious gesture of soul sight. So the moment we disidentify from the soul, uh, from the thought consciousness, from the surface movements, we have the ability to step into our inner being, the witnessing consciousness. There, you know, because of his sadhana, his being towered into pathless heights, naked of his vesture of humanity. So humanity is like a cloak that we are wearing. This limitation is like a jacket we are wearing. And this stepping back allows us to take off that limitation. So naked of its vesture of humanity, as thus it rose, his being, it rose to meet him bare and pure, to meet the divine, to meet the ultimate. His being rose to meet him bare and pure. A strong descent leaped down. So as Mother and Shurabindu say that when there is an aspiration from below, there is always a descent from above. And here we are talking of descent. Where earlier we were sharing that how his each part of his even physical being is full of that bliss. You know, that is, he, he almost faints, he shudders 
I think it will come right now. So a strong descent leaped down, a might, a flame, a beauty half visible with deathless eyes, a violent ecstasy, a sweetness dire, enveloped him with his stupendous limbs. So as if that divine being is so humongous, to, you know, and he's enveloping from all sides Ashwapati's being and penetrated nerve and heart and brain. So even the physical consciousness gets full of this thrill of the descent that thrilled and fainted with the epiphany, you know, so that the joy and the ecstasy is too great that the being cannot completely take it. The stability is shaken. That thrilled and fainted with the epiphany, his nature shuddered in the unknown's grasp. And why he is still able to go through this descent? Because he has been preparing. That's why we do yoga. You know, we, we prepare our being. Otherwise, it's not possible to have so much joy. I think very casually speaking, we can see that how even if when there is a little bit of joy and happiness in our life, which is not yet the ultimate bliss, how we really want to give it away. Like we want to spill it around, either by dancing around, by telling someone, you know, because it's too much joy. We can't contain it. And then we say that I want Ananda, you know, I can't even, you know, I can't even tolerate this little, little joy just that comes in day to day. So the being has to become so solid that it is able to contain that joy and bliss. Otherwise, you can, you know, really uh, the boat can be rocked. So in a moment shorter than death, longer than time, by a power more ruthless than love, happier than heaven. So it's such a power that it doesn't know any bound. It doesn't bother whether you die or you know faint because of its ecstasy. More ruthless than love, than love happier than heaven, taken sovereignly into eternal arms, hailed and coursed by a stark absolute bliss. So as if, you know, you imagine you have uh, somebody lying on the floor and you take his hand and you are dragging him with a force. So that kind of dragging, hailed and coursed by a stark absolute bliss. So, so much of bliss that the being is not able to have really, you know, a coherence. In a whirlwind circuit of delight and force, hurried into unimaginable depths, upborne into immeasurable heights. So as if you are just throwing something here and there, you know, his being was just thrown in an immeasurable sea of delight. Everywhere, wherever he was thrown, it was just delight, nothing else. It was torn out from its mortality and underwent a new and boneless change. So that's the transformation, as if he was just completely uprooted from usual human limitation that we live, complete uprooting, which for us is normal. But in this case, it just is taken away. Many a times we are living with chains and we don't even know we are living with chains unless they are taken apart from us. An omniscient knowing without sight or thought, an indecipherable omnipotence a mystic form that could contain the worlds, yet make one human breast its passionate shrine. So I think last time we had discussed shortly that how, you know, the same power, the same divine is at the same time individual, present within, cosmic, present everywhere, and beyond cosmic, transcendental, present even beyond the manifestation, same divine. And that same divine with these different manifestations, he can make, he's so all powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, all knowing. And yet he can make each one of us, if we are ready, if we are preparing ourselves, yet make one human breast its passionate shrine. And this divine being, he drew him out of his seeking loneliness into the magnitudes of God's embrace. So all the lonely journey that Ashupati was doing so far, it was just mingled and merged in this divine embrace. 
and that's the point where we last time read the essay by nolinita which was loan to loan so that's where we stopped any uh, reflections so far anyone anything to share yes i think it, like this passage is, is very it, it 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 talks about the, the something very important in in this integral yoga like is not only going beyond words and beyond thought, but, but also opens itself to the descent of a, a God's power. And, and I think this is so important uh, for, for, this, for this path, for this understanding. Uh, it reminds me of, of uh, what Sri Aurobindo says about his, his own yogic experience when, when he is with his guru, Vishnu, Vaska, Lele, and, and he attains you know, the, an absolute silence. He goes beyond, he rejects thought and uh, very easily only he could do that. But then, then he starts, uh, after this experience of, of nirvana, let's say, let's say uh, uh, he, he started uh, sorry for my English. Uh, he started to 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 see beyond uh, a, a supreme being that it's not just the, this this voice of, of silence, and and I think. Uh, this is where this particular yoga starts. That we are not just uh, wanting to go beyond thought to to stay in that voice of silence of nirvana, but to open ourselves to to the descent of something even great. Absolutely, yes, yes. And this, uh, I think, as Shurubindo and Mother say that this uh, stability in the silence the thought free silence is many yogas may just end there but their yoga of course as you are saying is going further but that doesn't mean that we can skip this step we can't yes. skip yeah yeah so in in i think earlier also these lines came when he's as if ashupati was shown as a rocket being launched you know and he's passing through that domain of silence further you know into the dynamic poise of brahman also he's not stopping in the silence plane but he's going further yes so absolutely resonate yes anyone else yeah so uh, if not any reflection we can go uh, further then if anyone is feeling ready, you can go ahead and just a second. I've lost something here. Yes, please go ahead. Anyone who feels ready to read the lines in pink. As when a timeless eye annuls the hours, abolishing the agent and the act so now his spirit shone out wide blank pure his vacant mind became an empty slate on which the universal and soul could write yeah so i think we see here that this this step the basic step, I think this comes again and again, and we can't uh, ignore this step. And as mother shares that if you want to be a little angel in the body, if we are aiming for physical transformation, first be the be a little angel in thought and mind also, you know, feelings and thoughts also. Because uh, we can't think and talk of physical transformation without uh, purifying fully 
as mother says you know each thought turns to the divine each feeling turns to the divine and there is no other demand and expectation than turning the whole being to the divine while we see that at this stage of our life we still from time to time do get distracted while we have to again and again pull ourselves back and turn again the thoughts to the divine and tell ourselves and reconfirm to ourselves that i want nothing else but the mother you know that's enough that's enough so i think we have to reconfirm again and again because we keep forgetting there is so much glitter out there that we keep forgetting so a as when a timeless eye annuls the hours, abolishing the agent and the act. So usually we are so stuck since we are living in this separate ego individuality, we are stuck in the doership. I am the doer and then there is something to be done. There is a separation. So I am the agent and then there is an act to be done. And here with this transformation or spiritual experience that he's sharing with us, he gets rid of that doership, that separation that is there between the karta bhav, the doership and the thing to be done. We always mostly, you know, you would see that it's the basic quality of ego consciousness that it is always focused on I am the doer, whether we admit it or not. But it is focused. But in this, Ashwapati lost this sense of separate self, individuality. And in this, as if he is watched by this eternal gaze, a timeless eye. And because of that gaze, what Zuan, Yuan was sharing, you know, this descent, as he opened himself to the descent, this timeless gaze, it annulled the hours. And also when we were talking of silence of thought here also, you know, going beyond mortal thought and annulling the hours. So time and thought are one. Time and thought are one. Wherever thought is, time is. So that's why we are bound in time because we are always thinking. <laughs> And there are moments which all of us have, I'm sure we have glimpsed, where you are just thought free for some time and that really as if time has stopped, time freezes for some time. You know, when there is no thought, no thought, no time. And also movement, whenever there is movement, there is time. Thought is also a movement of the mind, so there is time. So as when a timeless eye annuls the hours, abolishing because of this descent of the divine abolishing that doership and the act so that separation is vanished abolishing the agent and the act now his spirit shone out wide blank pure and this when i was reading this you know it reminded me of uh, saint kabir's one line he shares uh, in one of his songs he says chadariya jini re jini and Jyoki Tyo Dhardini. So in English it would be that I was given this very fine cloth when I took birth. But I have taken so supreme a care that it remained as delicate and stain free as it was given to me. The cloth that was given to me is stain free and delicate. Very fine, very refined. And now after this abolishing of the doership, limitation is gone, you know, one is not caught in the sense mind and the duality. Now his spirit is upfront. You know, spirit is the master of the being. Now his spirit shone out wide, blank, pure. And one of the prayers of the mother, mother uses this, which I think we'll take a few minutes to reflect upon. His vacant mind, became an empty slate now we can ask you know usually we have a vacant mind don't we <laughs> we question our mind that state normally we are so conditioned about it that probably i'm blank it, it is not good and we are not able to accept that blankness and we do get that yeah, yeah. so now this is again in kabir's uh, couplets also again and again this line comes 
where he says wake up why are you sleeping so when we are awake to our sense mind masters have ca- called that a sleeping state so all that comes through the sense perceptions i take in and then the mind which is the sixth sense it interprets and perceives and makes opinions and judgments this state of understanding is called as sleep by the masters so here it is talked about you know talking about an awakened mind you know a mind which has woken up from its sleep and sleep referring to when we are all the time busy in what is coming through the senses what am i touching what am i hearing what am i feeling what am i looking at and the sixth layer is the interpretation of the mind and all of that we believe in and that's our prison that's the prison we are in so now his mind is alert aware relaxed it's an alert woken up mind it's not caught in the sense mind on which the universal and soul could write so this empty page that he has created and this you know shurubindu shares this that there is nothing that can be done more beautifully that mind cannot do more beautifully in a silence thought free state he talks about that you know the importance of silencing the mind quieting down the mind and he says that the when the mind is quieted down it's like it's serving as a receptacle like a container in which higher insight higher intuition you know direct knowing that can descend but if i all the time buy into my thoughts and believe in whatever i am thinking is true then the container has no space for the new light to dawn it's like full of garbage so first we have to empty that you know, maintain that stability and purity so that a new light new intuition new insight can dawn so let me just uh, quickly share this prayer by the mother which is uh, november 20 1940 just sharing it yeah so this is almost whatever you know was being shared here very closely related to that so november 20 1914 oh i would be before the lord always like an absolutely blank page so that thy will may be written in me without any difficulty any mixture the very remembrance of past experiences should sometimes be swept away from thought so as not to obstruct this work of perpetual reconstruction which alone in a world of relativities permits thy perfect manifestation so each point each moment of time we have to keep cleaning the slate keep cleaning the slate keep cleaning the slate so that something new can be written while if we look at our ordinary consciousness we are mostly just regurgitating and ruminating the past so there is hardly any space for something new to be written while at the same time it's not that we are not craving for some newness in life we are but we are not able to let go of the past also so let me be like absolutely blank page so that thy will may be written in me without any difficulty any mixture the very remembrance of past experiences should sometimes be swept away from the thought so this has to be you know auto this has to be rejected that's where effort is required i'm i'm sure all of us you know know where the effort is required constant rejection of all this rumination and regurgitation they must be swept away from the thought so as not to obstruct this work of perpetual reconstruction something new always wants to build it itself up and if i don't clear the surface how can something new be written so that clearing just like we clean our houses every day almost every second day you know we do regularly 
otherwise dust accumulates dirt accumulates so that's the same with our being that this constant effort of cleaning and rejection of the garbage is necessary after often one clings to that which was i think this is an experience which is very common often one clings to that which was fearing to lose the result of a precious experience so one may have a beautiful you know meditative experience spiritual experience and yet we are sticking to that yet we are just reminding ourselves of the same experience again and again not making space for something new to happen to give up a vast and high consciousness to fall back into a lower state and yet what should he fear who is dying so even if i have to give up some beautiful experience if i belong to the divine what do i have to fear because if the divine has given me this experience he can also give me more experiences of course you know so what is the need of preservation here and yet what should he fear who is dying can he not walk with joyful soul and illumined bro upon the path thou tracest for him whatever it may be if even if this path be altogether incomprehensible to his limited reason and here is where the courage is required you know because this unfolding of life is beyond our reasonable mind we can't understand how the life is unfolding what is the plan the higher plan the greater plan so no matter how hard we try with our reason we can't put ends to ends together we we can't put the dots together and that's where the reason has to surrender to something higher you know, some higher unfolding so mother is sharing that what do we have to fear if i belong to you can he not walk with joyful soul and illumined bro so this certitude in us that yes i belong to the mother and mother knows the best for me so even when now things are happening in my life which are beyond my understanding yet i have this certitude that there is some greater cause here there is some greater purpose here even if this path be altogether incomprehensible to his limited reason o lord break the old frames of thought abolish past experiences dissolve the conscious synthesis if thou thinkest it necessary so even if new conscious synthesis is building up if you think that has to be blanked also sweep it away nothing is to be preserved so that thy work may be accomplished better and better thy service upon earth be perfected so the only thing that matters the only thing that matters is the divine work and the divine work is this perpetual journey towards self mastery perfection you know individually and collectively and for that everything is allowed everything is allowed and nothing no no matter how tragic or traumatic a situation may appear it is nothing in front of that divine work that needs to be accomplished yeah any uh, reflections any thoughts here anyone you said it all yeah it's a beautiful beautiful prayer very crisp and very uplifting very uplifting so this is what i think from time to time we have to do that we have to just check that i may theoretically think that i belong to the divine but the tension on my face doesn't tell me so <laughs> so let me just shed off the past shed off my worries again and again yet again yet again so that just divine matters and nothing else and then i can offer myself to whatever in day to day life is happening and one can just offer one's presence there so this was referring to this empty slate on which 
universal and soul could write. So let us take a few more lines and then we can see when to stop. Yeah, anyone who likes to read can unmute and please read. Yeah, Monica, I'll go. Yeah, All sure. that represses our fallen consciousness was taken from him like a forgotten load. A fire that seemed the body of a God consumed the limiting figures of the past and made large room for a new self to live. Beautiful. You know, in many uh, Sufi masters also, we see, I think, something like, uh, like emptying your cup. Yeah, we must have heard it many, many times. You know? Empty your cup so that something new can come. So this blankness, uh, and as in other traditions also, they share that this treasure that we are, like in Buddhism, they say Buddha nature, that the Buddha nature is kept safe, no matter how much sins we may have done. Whenever we make a choice to come back to our true essence, we can, because that diamond, that treasure is never stained or tainted by all the so-called wrongdoings or you know, sins that we may consider. And the same in, you know, here also mother shares that in Savitri, I think there is this line where he shares that this treasure is forever kept safe. Whenever we are ready, we can come back to this treasure. It is never, so only the surface, it appears that it is tainted. But who we truly are can never, never, ever, ever get tainted. And that's why there is hope. That's why there is hope even with the worst of criminals, worst of persons in this world that if he wishes to be a better person, if he wishes to get back to his true nature, he can, she can. So there is forever a hope. And just like I think last time we were sharing about this experiment being conducted, uh, Vipassana experiment, you know, which Kiran Bedi, one of the police officers here in India, she conducted uh, in Tihar jail, Tihar prison in Delhi, where she conducted uh, not herself, but she invited people to conduct Vipassana meditation sessions for prisoners because she wanted something higher there and how that really, really transformed so many of them. And then this was multiplied in various prisons throughout the world uh, because whenever we want and if we want, we, can't, we can immediately take a U-turn and create a new life for us. So we see that from time to time that we don't have to attain something. We just have to get rid of the layers of ignorance that we keep on accumulating. You know, the thoughts and limiting beliefs and limiting feelings, this disturbing emotions, the poisonous negative emotions that we think a part of our being. You know, all that slowly has to be shed. That's why mother talks about stepping back. Because if we continue to run their dictates, then there can't be any transformation. But initially, we have to keep stepping back. Wherever a ripple of ego consciousness arises, I step back. I look at it and I step back. Then again, look at it, step back. Look at it, step back. And the stepping back is a constant process that needs to be done. Otherwise, by default, what runs is the ego patterns. That's why vigilance is required. Sincerity is required. Consciousness in the being is required. So all that represses our fallen consciousness, all that makes us limited, suffocated, li living in a separate sense of self, all that was taken from him like a forgotten load. Such a load that actually he doesn't even have a memory that it was there. That's how it was taken away from him. So this burden of ego consciousness, this burden of limited sense of self, it was just ripped apart. He didn't even have the memory of that load that was taken away. A fire that seemed the body of a go God consumed 
the limiting figures of the past, fire of aspiration. As mother shares, you know, each thing that you think is limiting you, each thought that you see is limiting you, each feeling that you see is limiting you. you know, any limiting belief that you become conscious of is limiting you. Offer it into this aspiration fire, which burns at the center of our heart. Keep offering, keep offering. And the more we offer all these limiting things that, as an ahuti in that aspiration, fire of aspiration, that's where our true being gains stature. That's where we grow truly. And as Sri Aurobindo shares in the Aryan spirit when he describes that all these are intruders, desires, jealousy, ambition, lust, greed, vanity. All these are intruders which have actually taken this palace and make, made it their own. And now, whenever we become conscious of it, we have to look at it and we have to not follow the dictate, offer it into this fire of aspiration. That mother, I'm offering it. I don't want to follow this dictate. And that's how our true being gains stature. So a fire that seemed the body of a God consumed the limiting figures of the past. All that was limiting, all that was past of no use, it was just thrown into this fire as an ahuti and made large room for a new self to live. This room we have to continuously create. And I, you know, there is some construction renovation work going on in our house. And I was just wondering at it and I've been cleaning and sorting, organizing things for the past few days and just wondering that those things which we have not used for many years we still keep accumulating that one day it will be used and we don't even see that in the past five years that one day has not come and the things of past keeps accumulating keeps accumulating you know they keep accumulating and there is no space for the new and same with our being old habits which now are not beneficial, old patterns which are suffocating, old thought patterns, old patterns of feeling, old habits of physical. Now they are not helpful and yet we keep off on leaving them. So that has to be emptied. And that's where consciousness is very important because if I'm not conscious of this being, then how would I get to know? That's why mind has to get back home. That's why you know, these little, little meditation practices, they help because they bring the mind back home. And when the mind is back home, I can see, oh, you know, this one is now not suiting me. So I can let go of this thought, this belief. So just like we clean our houses, I think a continuous inner cleaning is required. You know, cleaning our inner temples. As Sri Aurobindo shares that if you wish to install the divine presence here, you have to keep the temple clean. Yeah. Yeah, any additions, any reflections? Any... Yes, the, the, in, in that, he says that in, in the mother, the, the book, and, and he says like, you don't you shouldn't ask for them for example you shouldn't ask for the mother to the mother for purity and then afterwards like invoke again uh, this this hostile forces and, uh, and it's true like maybe we can ask for something and, and and the divine will provide but our attachments and our you know usual ways of and patterns of thinking and, and emotional things. It's like we involve them again. It's like a constant work. Absolutely, yeah. It's like we keep on, you know, we offer it to the mother, then we again take it back. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And that's why, you know, that's why mother shares in one of the prayers that this has to be a long, a true transformation 
has to be even for the best a long and slow journey because this will happen this to and fro and back and forth will happen until we have a, an absolute conviction of the path yeah so there was this very beautiful uh, i thought we can end here uh, with this beautiful um i think writing from an nolini da here he says of love and aspiration i found it since we were talking of aspiration here and the body of god i thought maybe one of you i think you one you wanted to read so maybe you can read uh, this uh, for us it's a longer one it's too long <laughs> so if you want to stop in the middle you can stop we can take only half of it today but it's I, the lines are really very beautiful so yeah go ahead okay. there is a light before which all other lights is darkness oh sorry there is a light before which all other lights is darkness there is a strength before which all other strength is weakness there is a joy before which all other joy is suffering forward to the farthest upward to the highest downward into the deepest at the farthest awaits a humanity fulfilled and realized at the highest roots the divinity that propels and forges at the deepest dwells the instrument the individuality that obeys and executes we are aware of these triple elements house the triple movement find your one and total self in the dynamic union of the three this is the gate to fulfillment and harmony and the spirit delight in life a human in man seeks divinity the divine in man seeks humanity your smallness is only you can call your own your greatness is the greatness of the divine in you it is the godhead in you that can reveal god to you there is no other proof of god what you want to possess absolutely as your own will also claim to possess you as absolutely its own lose all and you fall into the bosom of boundless plenitude sacrifice all but into the radiant fire of aspiration that flames up to the gods the heart is the blazing heart of aspiration the divine door that opens into immortality of love ananda is the soul self mastery the head and purity the foundation the human approach the divine are danger seek god in god's ways i don't know if anyone yeah i think maybe we can just uh... do until this mm. part today yeah mm. yeah this one also is uh, i think i'll maybe read this the last bit sharda ji you want to share something no i i thought of reading it yeah please read yeah that would be nice just yeah. this much in blue you can read yeah. and then we can end it here yeah aspire and love ascending love leads to immortality descending love leads to death love is defeated as often as lust is victorious love is ascending ananda that leads to immortality lust is descending ananda that leads to death the secret of love is the joy of self giving the secret of joy is self giving if any part in you is without joy it means that it has not given itself it wants to keep itself for for itself beautiful <laughs>
Yeah, it's very very powerful. Can I repeat again? Of course, of course. Yeah, please do. Beautiful. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Aspire and love. Ascending love leads to immortality. Descending love leads to death. Love is defeated as often as lust is victorious. Love is ascending ananda that leads to immortality. Lust is descending ananda that leads to death. The secret of love is the joy of self-giving. The secret of joy is self-giving. If any part in you is without joy, if any part, okay, okay, if any part in you is without joy, it means that it has not given itself. It wants to keep itself for itself. Beautiful, Monica. Thanks for picking out this article. It's really beautiful. Will you yeah. please share in the group? Of course. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, it's very powerful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah, the I... secret of joy is self-giving. Mm -hmm. If any part in you is without joy, mm -hmm. that means, you know, we how many things we have, you know, the darker side. Now mm -hmm. we understand that yeah. it is not given. It is not offered. Yeah, yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. I think it's so easy to get into this habit of always begging. Yeah. It's very, you know, this is the slippery slope that, you know, today somebody was sharing. So today here in Gurgaon, we had a cloudy, foggy day today. You know, it was really dark. Throughout the day, it was a little dark. And uh, I met somebody in the evening and she was sharing that, uh, what a gloomy day so i thought you know i would maybe come out and take a walk and maybe talk to a few people and i said i exactly felt the same in the afternoon that really if i want to focus on the gloom right now Monica, because... your voice is breaking okay still still breaking i hear you it's clear. It's clear yeah yeah now it is clear. okay yeah okay okay so I was sharing that uh, in the afternoon, I also felt that gloom because of the day, how it was very cloudy and dark. And immediately I noticed myself noticing the gloom. And I said, no, <laughs> I have really so many things to be grateful for. I don't want to focus on the gloom. I really want to focus on what I already have and what all I can do, you know, with the positive aspects which are there rather than, you know, being sad and in dipped in mood. And immediately I was able to, you know, in that moment, make the turn. And then I met another person who was sharing that the atmospheric gloom was also, you know, becoming overpowering on her and how she had to come out and, you know, really walk a little, maybe talk to a couple of people, you know, so to, so as to get out of that gloom. You know? So, uh, and there I was feeling immediately when, you know, on self giving, actually, I was sharing this anecdote that in that moment of feeling that gloom as if some part of me is wanting something that what can i get so that i can become happy but the moment i noticed this gloom i immediately switched and i said okay whatever is there is there how can i offer myself you know whatever is today how can i offer myself and immediately i was not in that you know slipping gloomy mood at all so I think this really comes to me again and again, even in relationships I have seen, you know, uh, in myself that whenever I am unhappy in any relationship, it's always when a part of my being is just asking for something, expecting, demanding. And when immediately I switch to, okay, no matter anyone, you know, bothers or not, but I want to be available to everyone. You know, I am here. I am here as a backup, you know, so if, one other person may not be available for me when I need, but but I want to be available whenever anybody needs or you know wants me as a backup. So I think there it it really fills my being with a lot of joy. This uh, just this shift in inner attitude from asking to self giving. So this really resonates a lot. You know what you were reading. The secret of love is the joy of self giving. Yeah. And when one part is not happy, you know, that just know that that part is not, has not offered itself and given itself. Yeah. 
Yeah, any last comments, anyone? Reminds me a remark of the mother who was, I think, talking with a disciple and, and, and it says something like, if you feel you are depressed, then, then you should like note down, I am not sincere. Or, or, yeah. Or something yeah, like yeah, yeah. The day you are unhappy, just write down below it that I am not sincere today. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. And sincerity, you know, it means I've often wondered about this line from the mother. And it just tells me again and again that today I want something more than the mother. That mother is not enough and something else is necessary. So that's my insincerity. You know, and good to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Anyone else? Any last comments? Okay, so thank you everyone for joining, for listening so patiently and uh, reflecting and sharing and wish, wishing really everyone a cheerful, happy practice. I think we have really too much to be grateful for. So may, may we all are able to, you know, pick up threads from whatever is available and have a cheerful sadhana. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thanks thank for you. sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Experiences. Thank you. 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 Thank